そういうことを考えて、えー、死というものは邪魔を恐れないのかそれは私は病気になれば死を恐れます、えー、それからがんになるのも一番嫌で考えるのに恐ろしいそれだけに何か、えー、もっと名誉のあるもっと何かのためになる死に方をしたいと思いながらも結局ハークルの著者のように生まれてきた時代が悪くて、えー、一生そういうことを思い暮らしながら畳の上で死ぬことになるだろうと思います。When the novelist Yukio Mishima committed suicide on November 25, 1970, it shocked the world, not because of his fame, nor because he had just tried to overthrow the Japanese government, but because of the horrifying way in which he killed himself. After gathering a group of student followers, Mishima infiltrated an army base, took its commander hostage, and made a speech to the soldiers, urging them to rise up against the government. But as Mishima spoke to the crowd, it became clear that no one would join him. He had failed, so he knelt down. Picked up a knife and cut his stomach open. He fell to the floor, his gut spilling everywhere as he writhed in pain. Finally, a student holding a sword stepped forward and put him out of his misery by chopping off his head. Yukio Mishima had just committed seppuku, the ritual suicide that formed a part of samurai warrior culture for centuries. In this video, we're going to take a look at this gruesome practice and its long history from the era of the samurai to the present day. Let's dive in. Seppuku and Harakiri, a painful way to die. Seppuku, or Harakiri as it's more commonly referred to outside of Japan, may seem strange and horrifying to many people. It's a form of suicide in which the cutter drives a long, sharp knife into the soft flesh of the belly. They usually make a cut about an inch deep and up to six inches long. Often, they'll also make a second vertical cut to form the shape of a cross. This way of dying was not for the faint of heart. The person performing seppuku would have to not only endure the excruciating pain of cutting themselves, but they'd also have to use quite a bit of strength to get the job done. Because of how difficult this was, assistants known as kaishakunin would stand by with a sword in hand, ready to deliver a decapitating blow when it looked like the person could no longer take the pain. Now that you know what seppuku entails, you might wonder why would anybody do this to themselves? Well, there are multiple reasons. And they date back to medieval Japan. Why did the samurai commit seppuku? The first mentions of seppuku in Japanese history appear in the 12th century. This was a pretty rough time to be alive. Warlords constantly battled, while natural disasters made life unpredictable and dangerous. The result was that a single human life could seem insignificant, but seppuku could help give a life meaning, even if that meaning was gained through death. In countless medieval tales, warriors would slit their stomachs open and fling their intestines onto the ground rather than allow themselves to be captured by an enemy. Sometimes they would even taunt their enemies as they did so. If that sounds odd, consider the fate that often awaited prisoners in medieval Japan. For one thing, they could be tortured for information, or they could be executed using a variety of sadistic methods. Prisoners could be crucified, boiled alive, or burned at stake. They could also be humiliated either before or after being killed. For example, their captors could choose to parade them around or put their severed heads on display. Considering these less than appealing alternatives, self disembowelment made a certain kind of sense. But seppuku was more than just a helpful way to avoid capture. After all, as unpleasant and painful as it would be to cut your own stomach, it isn't very efficient if you're trying to die quickly. It can take hours to die from a self inflicted belly wound. Some men have even survived up to 19 hours after disemboweling themselves. So, why did samurai kill themselves in this particular way? The short answer is that it was painful and it was hard. By committing seppuku, samurai could show they weren't afraid of pain or death. In fact, the most gruesome forms of seppuku even turned these samurai into heroes in the eyes of their enemies. By willingly subjecting themselves to a horrible death, samurai could die honorably. Seppuku was essential to being a samurai. Although people were committing seppuku as far back as the 12th century, it was in the 17th century that it really started to define samurai culture. The 17th century began what is known as the Edo period. Unlike the previous violent centuries, marked by constant battles between warlords, the period from the early 1600s to the mid 1800s was relatively peaceful. During this time, the Tokugawa shogun set about centralizing the government and taming the samurai. The government attempted to do this by creating a code of conduct for the samurai to live by. This was known as Bushido or the Way of the Warrior. 
The code encouraged loyalty as well as a stoic attitude toward death. And what could be more stoic than cutting yourself open in one of the most painful ways imaginable? Bushido helped to elevate the samurai above the rest of the population, but so did seppuku. Seppuku fit in perfectly with the stoic ideal of the samurai because it was thought that only they could face death in such a gruesome way. Samurai were known to commit seppuku upon the deaths of their lords, after losing a battle, or even as a way to send a message. But beginning in the 1400s, one of the most common uses of seppuku was as a method of execution. Seppuku was used as an execution. Sometimes, samurai who found themselves on the losing side of a battle were allowed to commit seppuku rather than being executed in the typical ways. Notice that I said allowed to commit seppuku. That's because while suicide by stomach cutting may not seem like an attractive option to most, it was seen by the samurai as an extreme honor. In fact, Samurai weren't allowed to commit seppuku unless they had special permission. For those who didn't receive that special permission, they could be simply decapitated or strangled to death. While these methods might sound more merciful than disembowelment, they didn't provide the honor that came with seppuku. And it wasn't just the samurai themselves who could be forced to commit seppuku. In some instances, their wives or children could also be executed in this way. Children were usually tricked into it they would be given a paper dagger and told they were merely practicing for the real thing. As soon as the child slid the fake dagger across his belly, the Kaisha Kunin would leap up and decapitate the unsuspecting victim. Women sometimes performed their own particular form of suicide, known a jigai. In jigai, a woman would kneel down, tie her knees together for the sake of modesty, and instead of cutting her stomach, would slit her throat. One of the last executions by seppuku happened in 1868 when a man named Taki Zenaburo was forced to commit seppuku after ordering his troops to shoot at a group of foreign diplomats. An American who witnessed Zenaburo's death described the man's final moments in detail and, quote, a dead silence followed, broken only by the hideous noise of the blood throbbing out of the inert heat before us, which but a moment before had been a brave and chivalrous man. For a foreigner who had never seen seppuku, it undoubtedly left a pretty strong impression. Just a few years after Zenaburo's death, seppuku was banned as a method of execution. But just because it was no longer used for executions doesn't mean that seppuku disappeared entirely. Seppuku in the 20th century. Even in the age of atomic bombs and computers, people have been known to commit seppuku. Japanese soldiers fighting in the Pacific during World War II were told to choose death over being captured. Some soldiers decided to comply by cutting their stomachs. Many officers did the same when Japan surrendered. A notable example was Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi. As the man who had created the method of suicide air attacks known as kamikaze, Onishi had plenty to feel remorseful about. He had sent thousands of young Japanese to their deaths and was ready to pay the price for what he had done. After writing an apology letter to the families who had lost sons to his kamikaze attacks, Onishi prepared himself for seppuku, just as many samurai had done in previous centuries. Onishi, however, didn't use an assistant. After cutting his stomach and slitting his throat, he bled slowly for 15 hours before finally dying. When people tried to help him, he refused. For Onishi, seppuku was the only way to atone for his actions, and he was determined to suffer every minute. Like the breaking wheel or hanging, seppuku may seem out of place in the modern age, but as gruesome as it is, this practice has a long history that still causes fascination, wonder, and a bit of queasiness.